Today we're shifting gears a little bit. While before we have been focused on supervised methods, today we're going to talk about unsupervised methods. We'll first lay out the difference between classification supervised methods and unsupervised clustering methods. We'll talk about a couple of examples of these methods. One example is k-means. We'll talk about that algorithm at a conceptual level and an implementation level. Afterwards, we'll talk about clustering methods that can be used for discrete data, such as text. So first, what is clustering? Up to now, we've been talking about classification, where you have red dots and blue dots, and if you have some new test data, you need to decide whether it's going to be red or blue. Clustering is a different problem. You don't have any a priori notion of labels. You just have a bunch of data. And you want to divide those data into groups. And given a set of data, we want to find the best way to put it into two or three or five groups. Clustering is really useful in a lot of different domains. It's used in biological methods to figure out what genes are similar to each other that perhaps have similar functions in the body. It's used to look at brain scans of individuals to determine whether activity patterns in a brain are normal or not. It's also used in social networks to discover communities of people talking about the same things. It's also used on services like Amazon and Netflix to cluster types of products so that they're similar and thus can be recommended if you like one thing in this cluster, you may like another thing in this cluster because they have similar properties. Advertisers also use clustering to determine what kinds of people are buying their product. Clustering discovers the different kinds of consumers based on properties such as income, housing type, age, you might want to send different advertisements to these different clusters of people. One outgrowth of this market segmentation use of clustering has been in voter analysis. In recent elections, many of the campaigns have been focusing particular strategies on different segments of the population. In the political jargon, this is called micro-targeting where you first cluster your data and then explicitly derive one laser targeted ad for each of these groups. For example, one ad for young urban professionals who are between the ages of 20 and 24, another ad for retirees in Florida over the age of 60. Given all of these uses of clustering, we need to make a firm definition of what it means to discover clusters and evaluate when a cluster is good or not. Unlike classification, clustering's objective functions and evaluations are not as clear. It's an active area of research and, in fact, one of my primary research areas. We won't dwell a lot in class on how to define the number of clusters you should use or how to evaluate clustering, but if you actually use clustering in practice, you should have a clear notion of what it means to have a good cluster and apply that rigorously to your algorithm. But let's be more concrete here and focus on one very popular algorithm for doing clustering, an algorithm called k-means. This requires real value data, and the algorithm is very simple. You first start with k initial cluster means, and then, given those means, you take all the data observations that are closest to that mean and assign them to that cluster. And then you update the mean for that cluster by taking the average position of all the points in that cluster, and then you reassociate the closest data points to that cluster mean with that cluster. 
and then you stop your algorithm when there are no changes. Here's a really nice animation of uh, k-means that you might want to look at. But let's walk through an example. Let's say that you have data that look like this. You first randomly choose two cluster means by throwing dartboards on your data plane. And let's say that we have two clusters and we chose negative 1 and negative 1 and 0, 0. Now, for each data point, we compute the distance from the data point to each of these two clusters. We now associate each data point with one of these clusters. We associate it with the cluster that's closest to them. So given these two cluster means, we now have an association of each data point to one of the clusters. We break ties arbitrarily. After we do that, we have these clusters, but now we need to change the means of the clusters to reflect the data in those clusters. So the red mean moves down and to the left, and the green mean moves up and to the right. So we now have two means, the red one at negative 1.5 and negative 2.1, and the green one at 1 and 1.2. We again calculate the distances to each of the cluster means from each data point. That gives us a new assignment to clusters based on the one that's closest. And now we recompute the means. Now the red cluster moves a little to the right, but the green cluster doesn't change too much. And so again, we recalculate the distances from each data point to each cluster, and we make a new cluster assignment. But our new cluster assignments haven't changed since the last round. So this means that our algorithm has converged and we're done. These are our two different clusters. While it is always true that the k-means algorithm will terminate so long as you consistently break ties, you will not always get the same answer. It critically depends on what initialization you use for your algorithm, the initial darts that you threw at the page to get your initial means. Thus, it's important to try out different initializations and to see which of those different initializations gives you the best answer. R has a built-in implementation of k-means. I encourage you to try it out on various data sets that you're using. For example, if we apply k-means to the faithful data set and plot those clusters based on the eruption time and the waiting time, you get these clusterings that clearly divide the short eruptions and the short waiting time from the long waiting time and the long eruptions. K-means can also be used to make art. For example, you can take images, take each pixel in the image, represent it as a three-dimensional vector that includes all of the color information, do a k-means clustering of that, and then recolor those clusters in an artistic way. While k-means is very fast and very simple, it does not help you in situations where your data are discrete, or if your data can have more than one cluster. It makes sense that if you're trying to cluster the symbols that people write on a envelope, they will represent only one letter or number. And so there, it makes sense for each data point to have only one cluster assignment. But what if you're trying to separate documents into topics? In that case, it doesn't make sense to assume that each document has only one topic. An article can be about both 
medicine, and sports. Another problem is what if you don't know the number of clusters that you need to find a priori? For the rest of today, we'll be talking about algorithms that allow you to discover multiple clusters per individual data point, and we'll apply them to text documents. These algorithms are called topic models.